Hey everyone, welcome to the Dusty Wheel. I'm your host, The Innkeeper, and if this is the first time you've been with us, you've joined us for a live call-in talk show all about the Wheel of Time, and every once in a while we might cover some other series. But tonight is our second episode of the month, and that's when we do a live adaptation of the books. So if you happen to miss these before, after this one, you can always go catch up on the other world, but we are in the great hunt. And as Joe Perry in our YouTube channel just said, let's get hunting. And I'm feeling the same thing. But before we begin, I, I saw this really funny thing on Twitter and you should all go check it out. Uh, Wheel of Prime on Time, this parody account about Watt on Prime. And they made two hilarious announcements, one for Bieber and one for Lindsay Lohan tonight. So you should definitely follow them on Twitter. It, was, <laughs> it did catch me off guard for a moment. They made it look really just like all the you know Wadham Prime stuff that's come out recently uh, as far as announcements, and it was, it was pretty hilarious. I look forward to seeing who they announce next. But anyway, so that being said, if you missed last month's Great, Ad Great Hunt Adaptation Part 1, we made it all the way to when Moraine is speaking with the Amaryllin. So we're going to start there and see how far we get. And if you haven't seen this before, it's just a good old fun time with my panelists where we sit here and we break down the show scene by scene and we determine what we're going to keep and what we're going to kill. And then we try to track your comments and try to pull you into the show. And sometime around 20, 30 minutes of the show, we'll open up the call line and let you give us a call and chat with you about what you think we should keep or get rid of. So that being said, I want to introduce my lovely panelists. Welcome everyone to the show. There's Todd, Tal, and Tyler. We don't have Mary tonight. Hey, welcome you three. Hey. 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 Nice to see you. <laughs> Tyler's back. Tyler, you caused a little bit of a commotion last time you came on. No. You, you, you kind of caught Todd and I off guard when you suggested <laughs> we drop the entire Dark Friend social scene. So for those that are watching, go back, <laughs> go back and check that out. <laughs> We almost did. I, I think we kind of did like an amalgamation. We had like this, uh, we had this prom. I think it was like the Dark Friend prom uh, where the Forsaken showed up along with maybe some of the Dark just dark Friend social thing. But Tyler, it's <laughs> awesome to have you back. I'm looking forward to seeing what you, uh, how you changed the discussion today. So why don't we get back into this? So the Moraine has just left the Amarillan. They've figured it all out. She's tied this up. Uh, Rand's going to take the horn down to Ilion. He's going to get this army behind him. They're all excited. This is perfect. And then we are, then we're introduced to Jim from Bornhold, who, who is now going out, is sent out to the Almuth Plain. We get this little kind of side scene. And so we, before we jump back to Faldar, I kind of want to ask your opinions here. We, we meet the questioners really briefly. Do you three think that we need to get into the politics of the White Cloaks at this point? Is this a, is this a good moment to dig into them a bit more now that we've, we were introduced to them somewhat? And I, I'm, I'm kind of assuming here just from some of the images we've seen come out of, you know, uh, from Narg, the Trolloc, you know, that does seem like we're going to have the White Cloaks in the show. So do we need to get into the politics? Tal, what's your initial you know, reaction to that? The only thing I would keep is the flashback with Pedro and Neil. Um, so I wouldn't keep the the in-camera stuff where they're riding towards Almuth and they meet up with the questioners. What I would keep is the meeting between uh, Jeffram and uh, Pedro and Neil where they're alone. And uh, Pedro says, like, I'm not giving you all the details. You can't have them. Okay, so you'd, you'd touch on a little bit, but yeah. not, go, not go into... Do you think we need, so you don't think we need this like questioner no. thing them out there? Oh, no. We don't know who these people are. It's not important. Okay. Okay. Anyone disagree? Todd? Tyler? I have in my notes, I have shorten or cut because I, I agree with Tal what needs to go away and what needs to stay. And if we do need to see the questioners, it needs to be very brief when they're talking about the Shaunchen, and that's about it. Um, okay. Honestly, I don't think we really even need that. I mean, there's so much that's happening here in, the, in Faldara. And by the way, to Dana's point, I always say Amarillin. That's just what I say. <laughs> she, she's pointing out that I pronounce it incorrectly, but it's one of those things I can't get over. So uh, I'll, I'll do my best, but, you know, Amarillin is just how I'm going to always say it. Yeah, at this so, point, we're not, we're not at, teaching it. It's, it's been too many decades. Uh, someday <laughs> I, should, I should do that, do like a special like pronunciation segment. Uh, but yeah, this, this piece, I, I guess I don't really have any, um, any problem with with not going too deep here into the politics, but it does give Rafe an opportunity to 
to dig in. It just depends on, in my opinion, how much he wants to bring them into the series in a in a deeper in a deeper way, I guess. And I think this is an, this is an opportunity to do with that. I mean, obviously, we get a little bit of that at the beginning of this book um, with boars, if you will. But it, it, this would give an opportunity for us to finally kind of get some command structure, you know, some depth and maybe history, a feel behind that. So. I, maybe you're right. We don't have to go out to the Alma plane with them, but you know, digging in a little bit here could be useful. Tyler, what's your what's your thought? I think it seems like they're expanding the role of the White Cloaks a little bit. So if they're going to show them in the books where they don't usually show up, the way to do that, I think, is bringing Galad in and showing that Galad, who we met in the first uh, book, or at least has been talked about, uh, is with them, and then he can be our viewpoint character, showing us. Uh, basically him and even Valda and Vors going off on merry adventures wherever they go, but they, they will be our insight into everything White Cloak. There will be no other White Cloak characters, just these three and maybe Jared Byar. It's interesting. The merry adventures of Galad, Vors. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> the three White Cloak musketeers. Oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, but, but so... The real point of having the, the White Cloaks there was really to like start introducing more of the fact that the Shanchan are around. And exactly. that's really the tricky part, mm -hmm. I think, is between Varen's rumors about uh, trouble out west uh, and the White Cloaks, like there's two different ways that they can show us what's happening out there. Um, and eventually that way when Rand shows up, it's not just like, oh, who are these guys? Where do they come from? What the heck's going on? Man, I want yeah. somebody, I want somebody to put together a graphic of Galad and and Boars and uh, <laughs> I, I want all of them on a, on a cover of something. That <laughs> the Merry Adventures. Um, I mean, from a literary per perspective, Matt, this is Jordan yeah. laying track. Sure. Right. For sure. So this is this is him laying track to get us to um, that place at the end of the book. Um, <laughs> that place. Yeah. That one. <laughs> that place. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> to get us to that one place yeah um, you know yeah no and i agree with that and i mean obviously the other person that's part of that uh happening is leandrin so let's segue back right it's a short scene let's jump back into it the end of chapter five has leandrin going in and using the one power here uh with lady what how do you say it? amalisa yeah um she she uses it here, and we, we get into her, her head a bit, right? We, we get a little, um, uh, we get to know her a little bit more. Do we need to know and do we need to believe? How much do you want in this moment to believe that she's Black Aja? Or how much do you want to believe that she just is politically op opposite than, the, than, you know, than Moraine and the others? I mean, how much, how much is that yeah. tension here important? In my opinion, it, it depends on whether they're going to show that the red are really crappy people to deal with, or I, I want to say I want to say the worst word, but you know, um, nasty women. Yeah, they're really horrible women. Uh, or is and is it just because she's a red that she's so nasty, or is it because she's black? And, and it depends on how they're going to try to play that in the show. Yeah, I mean, where, where do you think we should go here, Tyler? Do you think that should be very obvious that she is Black Aja? Or, again, do you well, want do you want Rafe to kind of play as the hand close here? Uh, she's got to be really bad. Uh, whether the people want to associate that with red or black doesn't matter. But one of the main ideas of making her black, I think, is that it detracts attention away from all the other people who might be black that we've been introduced to. And as we know, there are a lot of them hiding around various corners down hallways everyone around is potentially black and some of them turn out to be black and that ends up being uh kind of powerful so when you have leandrin uh, as your uh let's call it the obvious villain the one that you've been revealed uh you don't necessarily think that there's a number of other blacks lying in wait yeah i mean the the retinue that the amaralyn brings to faldara is <laughs> there are a lot of black sisters yo yeah, but do you want it, Do you want this to be about the Red Aja? You know what I mean. Do you want this to be, uh, you know, just showing the kind of polar opposite way that they approach the world? Uh, you know, again, I, I don't know. This this We've is already seen Elida. <laughs> yeah, yes. like I don't. I'm, in my notes, it's cut. Like I don't need any of this. Okay, so you you would rather just even drop this scene? 
I, I, see, honestly, I, I don't see it as necessary. See, I, I um, don't. Th I don't think the aftermath of this is necessary that we'll get into, right? I don't think that we have to go see the lady and her ladies going around searching for the boys necessarily. But I do like the scene because I feel like Leandrin plays an important part in this, and so we. You know, we want to get to know her, and I think this is a good way to find out and see how she manipulates people. Now, sure. Now we do see some of that. Obviously, her first interaction with us could be here shortly in chapter six, where we see her, and that interaction with Rand, and that could be a good place to begin it. I just I like laying the foundation here for her. My, you know, that was just that question of, you know, do we want that foundation to be like she's you know, she's problematic red, or do we want that foundation to be she's black Aja? I mean, she kind of comes in and she's like, hey, there's black Aja. It's kind of on the nose a bit, as Jordan does sometimes with us. We just don't find out for sure until later. Todd, I mean, it do you, doesn't, yeah. oh, sorry, doesn't go ahead, further Todd. the story, Matt. No, you're right. You're right. This it doesn't. This doesn't push us along. So, I mean, Todd, are you into dropping this scene completely and just getting to know Leander and elsewhere? Oh, I'm fine with cutting it. Uh, yeah, I have no problem with that. Okay. Are you in, Tyler? Are you in for cut? Uh, a cut is fine. Uh, I think if she's going to show up later, leading the girls around the world to uh, Tom and Head, then uh, maybe we need to see her at some point here. But it's yeah. not. That's a good point. And if we do, we have a, we have a nice scene that comes up here quickly. Uh, you know that will give us some of that uh, Leandrin. <laughs> I mean, it just almost is a repeat scene, and so I, I agree with you there. Let's let's cut it. I don't have um, I don't have any I don't have any problem uh, with this cut at all. I think this is a this is a good place. Let's get rid of this scene. A little extra scene there with Jim from Bornhold, and let's just get to the get to the details here. So jumping into chapter six, then. Well, oh, the, oh, you oh, sorry. skipped the part. I know, I know, I did. Uh -huh. I did. How can I skip this part? How can I skip? This I don't part? know. Pat and Fane, right? And I and I jokingly was going to write in a, in a tweet that I there's a lot of goodbyes uh, that we're going to talk about today. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> when when Pat and Fane says goodbye here to uh, to Rand, in essence, right? As he's as he's looking up. Um, yeah. What do you think about this piece? Uh, we get very little. Uh, it's really subtle in the books. Uh, do you want this to be? Do you want to see more of what's happening? behind the individual who opens his his cell door in essence do you want no. to see the destruction or do you want to see that later and just get the same no. subtle nature of the scene yeah i like it subtle okay no so do i it's the original you know <laughs> yeah it is yeah. right i did catch that this time i was like oh you know i i forgot that it was i can't remember i i feel i i should have looked this up i did we ever was it ever revealed exactly who lets him out What's... I can't remember if we, if it was if we if it's actually revealed about him or not. I guess we can ask those sitting in uh, the chat. It was something I meant. I, I thought I knew it, that it had been, but I wasn't sure. So, but yeah. So I like the subtle nature of the scene, and Pat and Fane <laughs> hopefully plays big on that. What are you laughing at, Tom? Just Todd reading, reaching for his book. <laughs> I I have here the companion. I don't know if it'll say it in there. C.G. Nefarious says that it was Uno. Uh, I, I don't remember uh, here. It was uh, not Uno. I know. It's not Uno is not a dark friend. I know, but I thought... Eventually, they blamed the two guards who were on duty because they got killed, uh, and they find their bodies later on. So um, they get the blame for it, but it could have been anyone, really. Yeah, I it mean... It could have been Inktar. It could have been Varen. Yeah, there could have been a lot of people here, and I do like the kind of uh, similarities between the Uno here and, and Asmodean, so... Okay, so yeah, this is, you're right, I shouldn't have jumped over this. This is probably the most important piece that happens here in, in five, which pretty much is kicking off the pandemonium that we run into here in the next a couple chapters with Good Fane work. leaving. <laughs> Good work. And by the way, anyone that's watching us, you haven't been with us, we're, we always will accidentally or on purpose spoil stuff from all the books. Uh, we, we don't generally go there in the live adaptations. Uh, it's just if something, ha if something happens to come up with, you know, in the book or something after the book that relates to this, you know, and uh, we typically spoil things, you know, within a couple of books. We don't usually go all the way to a memory of light. But <laughs> so I apologize now if you've already had anything spoiled. So, yeah, let's My move bad. on. P Pat and Fane escapes here. And then we get Rand in Chapter 6. Now, we, uh, we have this... 
dream scene again. And if you've watched all of our, <laughs> we've had this discussion many times. Here's another dream scene where Shawn Wait, Mael, what, what, you, yeah. you want to know who, who let Fane go? Yeah, go for it. I do. It says he escaped with the help of Ingtar and a fade and stole the dagger from Shatter Logoth and the Horn of Valair. Nice. Well done, Todd. Thanks for bringing that in. Yes. So I said I thought it was Inktar, but I then I couldn't remember if it had been. So I'm glad you've verified that with us. Inktar let him out, and Fane was a little bit surprised that it was him, probably because you know, well, we're all. I think a lot of us were surprised. At least I was the first yeah. time through. Oh yeah. So, um, yeah. So we get this part where Rand has this dream of Ishamael and Fane, and they're all kind of they're saying together the battle's never over, and he disturbs him, wakes him up. Back to this question, dreams are going to be playing a, a much larger part in the books as we move forward. How much of these one-off dreams from Rand do you want to see, Tal, here? Do we need to see more of them than we saw in the first season? Or no, sir. Is this... Skip it. Skip the, skip the dream. Is that where you're at, yes. Tyler? You think we should drop, uh, these, drop this dream, or do you think it plays an important kind of formational part of this it, second isn't season? The... Isn't the villain we're going to see through all of this season like the uh, master of dreams, the uh, the one who gives you nightmares? And uh, yeah, I thought Lanfear was big on dreams. And this is a, if you want to reintroduce the concept of the world of dreams and have it play a role later, uh, I think the way to do that is keep some of these dreams and may mostly make them related to the dangers of uh, getting involved with Lanfear. And that will increase the menace that she has later on. So uh, I see that there's no reason not to have it. But really, if you have it, it's because you're linking it to Lanfear or you're linking it to later stuff you're going to do with the world of dreams. Now, a couple of people in the, in the chat are saying, you know, uh, they were asking, did, did dreams get cut in our book one of our adaptation? And, you know, and Beth mentioned that uh, minimizing the number of dreams makes them more impactful. I agree with all those things. We didn't drop them completely from book one, but we did minimize them, right? There was kind of a lot of, a lot of you on the, I, I wasn't for it, but a lot of, a lot of my panelists wanted to minimize Lydia's dreams. And that's true. It does have more impact, but Ishamel comes back. And so it really, maybe this has, a, maybe this question has a lot to do with what Rafe and his team do with that battle with Rand. You know, in the books, Rand's convinced he's killed the Dark One. You know, that's, uh, and so he sees him in his dream and that kind of reintroduces him as this villain that's going to persist. So I, I but you know, I'm, I'm fine with cutting this one because I, I hate the return of villains, uh, you know, the same villain over and over again. And so the fact that it, we wait a little bit longer to have a Shamayla show up I think that works plenty well. We're going to see him a lot this, in this, you know. We're going to see him. We're going to see Lanfear show up and all these things. So, I'm fine with cutting the scene. Tyler is kind of on the fence. Todd, what do you think about this? Do we need to? Is it a? Is it a keep dream for you or I, a, or a move or a cut? I'm a I'm a cut. I'm a full on. I, I'm just. I never have been a fan of the dreams, and I, you know, I like the dream world, but I've never just been a fan of the way these dreams work at the beginning. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So Tyler, you've been outvoted. We have cut the we have cut this dream, and we're just jumping into Rand uh, waking up in Egwene's room on a pallet. You know, obviously disturbed that he had a dream here. And Nynaeve is there, right? And she's Rand's like having this conversation with her, and the bell rings. I kind of want to just him to wake up. I don't think we need this little segue scene with 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 her there and then having this really short chat you know that doesn't seem totally necessary maybe he wakes up and sees her and then immediately we have you know the aftermath of the you know the bell ringing and you know we have uh you know again that well, pandemonium scene here do you, do we think we need this moment he has with... to name the he has to name the dark one because he blames himself for the raid because he named the dark one i don't okay so that yes <laughs> But I don't know that we need that. Do we need, do we need his his angst about you know? Honestly, maybe we uh, I keep jumping in. I'm sorry, Matt. No, go ahead, Tom. No, I'm saying too much. Go for it. No, I just like he knows that Fane thinks he's special and that Fane is following him. He knows that he can channel. He knows that Maureen thinks he's the Dragon Reborn. He's blaming himself, anyways. I don't know that naming the Dark One um, in that conversation is necessary uh i mean i see it because he does cite it a couple of times but 
He's already. Did you just angsty. say that? Yeah, I was gonna say. Did you just say that angsty Rand didn't need to be angsty yet? Is that how you were? <laughs> to say he just that? didn't need to be angstier. He was angsty, angsty. enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. angsty Rand doesn't need to be angsty yet yeah but i do love the setting like i love your idea matt of him waking up to the bells yeah there's something just kind of you know we see we see fane you know escape and in that moment Rand wakes up from a dream almost like he knew right the dream woke him and then the and then it then it goes then it goes off right so i like the kind of just the rush right into that as though almost like the dream warned him if that makes sense that something was happening um and so, yeah, I, I like that. I don't think we have to vote on whether or not we keep Nynaeve here and, and, their, and their scene per se. But do we need – here's this moment, right? Rand freaks out because Egwene is, went down to see Fane, right? And Rand wakes up and he's like, she must be there. He runs through the, uh, the women's apartments here. He sees the Amarillan. He runs past everyone. Everyone's freaking out. And he fights – well, he almost fights some Trolloc, but <laughs> – then and the men come rushing by him and take care of that. And so he, he slips by there and he runs into a fade. And then we have Inktar show up. Do we need all of this kind of like, I mean, we're going to get it probably visually. And I like that. We're going to get Rand running through and he's going to run into all these, you know, uh, monsters and, you know, dark, dark friends and such. Uh, and then he's going to get down to the cells, the dungeon. No, you went too fast. Did I, did I, what did I, which part did I miss when he got to the dungeon? Well, I just sort of feel like the battle inside Feldara, like inside the hallways, inside okay. the courtyards, is just like at the cross hatches of the court of the of the hallways. It's just so evocative. Yeah, I don't know that we get its equal until we go back to the Stone of Tear. Okay, yeah, let's pull back for a second. I like that. Um, I like that a lot. Adding some scenes here that we don't see in the books necessarily. Like it's not right? just just Rand's point of view. Let's pull back from that. I do agree that it would be nice to get a feel, which I don't think a lot of enough shows do in this genre. You know, uh, I don't want to go down the road of speaking about the ones that do this poorly, but you get too much of that, you know, first person view of some battle. And it's like you hear just ringing, you know, swords ringing from the courtyard or whatever. But then you just see one person in a hallway with three other people. And it doesn't give you the scale of the attack that's going on. So, no, I, well, I, I, I like that. And there's a beautiful moment with Ingtar where he's basically like, then go to her. Like, he's like, Egwin's in this, you know, in the dungeon. He's like, great, go get her. Like, I'm good here. Yeah, and Joe Perry points out that the Ingtar fade moment is a great foreshadowing. I agree with that. Oh, yeah. huge. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Yeah, I think that's... Because, and especially when you find out about Ingtar later and you wonder if he let the fade go. Oh, you know he did. Yes. He keeps on being part of these moments where you're like, you really think he's an amazing guy, but then you're really questioning his loyalties. <laughs> yeah. there's, a, there's a variety of moments like that where he's, he's super well, obsessive. Especially since, I mean, his motivation for becoming a dark friend was this totally nihilistic, the world is ending and we're just getting crushed. Like there's no winning this battle. Yeah. It's not for a lack, it's because of his love for Shinar, you know, like it's not, it's tricky with Ingtar. Yeah. Do you want them? So let's let's uh, let's pull that back, Tyler. Then for let's go to Ingtar. How much is it is it important that we kind of almost raise his? I guess that's not raise his profile, but do we need to give him point of views? Do we need to? Uh, do you want Rafe and his team to take Ingtar and really kind of dig in there and give him to us as a character that we don't necessarily see in the books? We just kind of get from these fleeting moments. Do you want more Ingtar, Tyler? Yeah. I think you're not going to have a choice. Uh, Ingtar is, for all intents and purposes, his father figure throughout the rest of the book. He's following along. He's trying to live up to uh, the mission that Ingtar is leading, that he's the second mm -hmm. in command of. So he's going to be looking up to him regardless because he's a stand-in for Lan. He's a stand-in for Tam. So you're you, with, without even trying, you're going to um, to have that. Yeah, great. Uh, but, yeah. but I think one, one of the things that I'm a bit wary of is so many of the things that we want to keep are very plot related or very rand centric and we shouldn't forget that Nynaeve and Egwene are characters of great importance in their own right and they're going to have their moments so like rand talking to Nynaeve before uh, the, all this happens it's not just about what rand gets out of it it's about Nynaeve's motivation because eventually she says i'm going to go to the tower and i'm going to learn all this stuff because that's how i'm going to protect the kids that run my care 
So it's That's true. kind of important, uh, not just for the ran or the plot elements, but also for uh, those characters, because that's what their central motivation is for a lot of the trials they're going to go through for the next couple of months. That's yeah, true. That's, it, does, it does show that she is minding them, that she feels that deep. I mean, I think season one's going to convince us. And the only reason I thought, I thought of dropping the scene was I'm expecting Rafe and his team to really make her, you know, her desire to protect uh, you know, these kids from her village. It's something that the that the viewer is going to know so much so that we don't necessarily need a constant kind of thread of reminders here. But I agree with you there that if I took this scene in more of an isolation, I would say you're right. I mean, we need to we need to feel that 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 continues, and I could see them. You know, it doesn't take much, right? That would take about. <laughs> You have the room set up, right? Not Even from much. a production standpoint, you have the room. He's waking up. It's in the apartments, putting a chair there and having her there and then having them have a short scene. You know, it's it's an important piece. So I, I absolutely and thank you for calling that out. I think that's uh, that we we should be careful as we cut that we're not cutting too much of kind of these foundational kind of meaningful scenes, even though Jordan kind of throws a lot of them in. Yeah. And at times you're like, do I need all of this? But it is part of why we love these characters and love these books. Uh, On the flip side, Matt, there's a really beautiful moment between her and Maureen coming up in the courtyard that about covers it. So There is. There is. And that's why I think some of these – well, that's why I think you can drop that Landrin scene, right? Because we have yeah. this one that's coming up here, right? Rand leaves him. I, I agree. We have this scene with Ingtar, and he's like, go. You know, in essence, I got to go down to Egwene. And so he goes down to the dungeon, and I, I look forward – this is going to be one of my favorite scenes – and I, I, it can't be cut and it won't be cut. No. You know, Rand going down, this is going to be kind of a pivotal scene in the beginning, what I hope to be the beginning of the second season of the TV series. But it could also be right at the end. I, this is absolutely could be the end of the first uh, season of the TV series. But Rand going into the dungeon and seeing the blood and just the gore, uh, the destruction, whatever you want to call it, almost like, you know, uh, we had a Gollum in there and. Uh, you know that that he goes in there and he sees what's read what's written on the wall to him from clearly from Fane, and him scrubbing that off the wall and then Leandrin coming in and using the one power on him and almost you know basically torturing him until Moraine shows up like this is such an amazing scene here that we have to keep is there something about this scene Todd that you know is kind of the, the most pivotal piece to you when you when you think about this when you're like I want Rafe to get this right is there anything that comes to mind um yeah I mean I, yeah I, I like that they named that that uh Fane named him Althor he he actually wrote his name down and said you know I know who you are um and I think that's one of the things that really needs to be kept that. And when they show that the dagger is gone. Uh, yeah. I, I, I think that needs to be shown also. All of it. Yeah. All this, this, this like seems like, scene. yeah, I don't think that you can drop anything in here. Obviously him finding Egwene and Matt knocked out Moraine clearly somehow for the, for the viewer being aware of their, in essence, their injuries here, and this feeling that Matt, right, hopefully they've built up in the TV series this love of this character because in this moment where they say that, uh, it, that basically Matt without the dagger, you know, that, that there's this, this dagger being severed, taken from him is not just kind of like a, oh, shoot, someone stole his favorite toy, right? This, the, this mm -hmm. is the potential end of this, you know, this character for the viewer. And hopefully they play this really well that you feel yeah, that, I want right? to see how I want to see how Rosamund Pike can because you know there's this touching mat and and the Aes Sedai have this yeah they don't really want to do it but they do it you know and, and I want to see how she handles that mm -hmm. and, and being and going right for the dagger and hopefully mm -hmm. it's yeah hopefully it's something you can just see on her face like the absence of the dagger and because I think there's going to be this question of how much does she really care about these individuals you know how much I think the whole first season is, are they pawns? You know, how much does she? Do you think of, so? I think so. Yeah, I, I think the. I think if they play it right, you'll you'll still question where that she's. I mean, look at her. Look at her conversation with the Amarillan, right? It's like, yeah, we're gonna give him the horn and we're gonna send him to Ilion and he'll get an army because this is 
this is my, I mean, Moraine, this is Moraine's plan for the world. These people are, you know, figures that she can play off. And I think that she does treat them that way. Uh, you know, not because she's a bad person or anything, but because she's been, this is a 20 some odd year kind of uh, series of events that are moving towards something that is really important to her. And in the end, these people are pivotal to it. But uh, I don't know that that's, I, I don't know, to me, it doesn't play in every scene that she just loves and cares about each one of these individuals. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm not convinced that she does necessarily yet, um, to your point. Um, can we pop back to the dungeon real quick? Let's do it. Yeah. There's a really beautiful moment with Varen and Sarah Fell where they're talking about the writing and just making like comments back and forth. <laughs> yeah, about, yeah, yeah. Ooh, this is a much finer, <laughs> this is a nicer hand. Probably not a Trolloc. Yes, uh, I we it's have adorable. to get that. Yeah, that just for Varen's sake, we need we need the viewer to sit there and 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 just ask themselves like pretty much like W. <laughs> there needs to be like a WTF yeah. moment of like, and that's what I think. This whole section of Faldara should open the you know should open the mind of every viewer of there's the Aes Sedai are so diverse, right? <laughs> there's so mm. many you know beyond just the colors right we're talking about just a really diverse group that's so large and and this makes them even quirkier and weird and hard to understand and thankfully it kind of uh, will hide Varen for a while for for the viewers uh which is good but yeah no i agree thank you for bringing that up we have to have that um and i agree with elijah and chat I agree that because maureen's blue right that's that's part of who she is um uh, so yeah, I, yeah, and Dana brought up that she plays the game of houses on a on a world level. Uh, absolutely, that's so, true. But I, so that's what that's what I want to see her look for the dagger because I think there's a moment that they can kind of drag out some humanity in her, where uh -huh. where maybe the viewer doesn't get it, but she really cares about Matt and she, the absence of the dagger. She realizes is, you know, and and you could you could play it off like, well, he's one of the Taveran and she needs him, so she doesn't want him to die and that kind of piece, but. There is some humanity that, that could be added in that scene, which I love. Uh, Tyler, is there anything about that scene that you would add to or change? Uh, yeah, not so much add, just that uh, like there's a lot of words written in blood there, and Pat and Thane would have taken an hour and a half to write all that. So it's really got to be just limited to Althor's name, uh, I'm going to Toman Head, and maybe something indicating land fear. Um, but j whatever it is is enough for Varen to then bring her curiosity to bear and point out uh, what she's observed to uh, Maureen and Swan and say, I figured out that you guys are with the Dragon Reborn and it's one of these three kids and that's what brings her in the circle of trust and sets up the big confrontation with Rand uh, when they question him in about the next couple of hours. Hmm. Yeah, like we don't need yeah. a whole long poem on the wall. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. Hey, uh, and by the way, Tyler, uh, is your phone sideways? You 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 you, you, you turn sideways there on the on the okay. uh, image there. I can fix that. It it cut out earlier, so. Oh, gotcha. I'll let you know. I'll let you know. No worries. So right. I I agree with that piece. When when Varen reads the entire prophecy, you're like, just how long was somebody writing in Trolloc script down there? Like, you can just imagine they're like rubbing it off. Like, shoot, I got that word wrong. And they have to like, we're rubbing the blood off and they're like writing it again. Got a comma. <laughs> Damn it. You know, like, yeah, there's a, but, but there is like, yeah, you're right. I think they could definitely cut down that prophecy a bit <laughs> when, cause like I said, when Varen tells you how long the prophecy is, you're just like, yeah, I guess maybe Fane just kind of waited, you know, or some Trolloc was just like left there, you know, like he's going to, he's our suicide bomber Trolloc. He just <laughs> is a. He's just gonna die, but he's gonna die once he tells us the prophecy. You know, he's gonna he's gonna write it until he dies. I'm not Trollocs aren't writing the prophecy, but do whoever... we do we know who made the original order? Narg Narg is down there, and he can write. Uh, no, <laughs> when you say the original order, what do you mean? Uh, to keep Rand in the keep. Uh, no, I don't. So think all of we... chapter five, he's desperately trying to get the hell out, and he's told at every gate he's not allowed to, and presumably the order comes from Agomar. And then at the very, very end of the chapter, they're like, what you talking about? No. <laughs> no, Obviously but, Ingtar. Well, so no, it goes, yeah, it could be Ingtar. I think it's probably a lot of, I think it's, there's a lot going on there. You're not quite sure because something comes up later with Moraine saying, well, he can leave now. 
you know, and the question is, did she want to stop him? You know, but it's possible, you know, what, maybe that was multiple. Maybe that was like more rain. There, there could be like lots of parties and they all are telling people no one can leave. <laughs> I was just curious. I don't need it in this show. No, I would, I would love, I would love for that to be the case. I, I don't need it. Yeah, I don't need a com a comedy moment where like the guy at the gates being told by seven people not to let somebody out. That's for sure. I like what Mary Sue uh, said in chat. Fain tortured a trollic into mastering blood calligraphy. I like it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so out of the dungeon. I didn't really want to leave that place. That was that's gonna be an amazing scene in the show. Um, and then Matt's, we, we find out the next, Matt's taken out. He's uh, taken up to the Amarillans' uh, suite. And Moraine and Varen uh, speak here as, uh, I guess Matt was healed, and we don't see that scene. Do we need, and do you want to actually see the healing take place in this moment? No. Tyler says no, no and I say yes. No, and no, I say I, no. I, I actually want the whole thing cut. Uh, there's no reason to even give Matt extra healing. That's true. The fact that they delayed this is like a plot point that they add, but all they have to do is when he originally gets the dagger, say like, we really need to heal him and we need the dagger to do that. And oh my gosh, it's gone now and he'll die in a couple of months. So, so it's, yeah, you, it's you okay. Yeah, you could. All right. I'm convinced. <laughs> that didn't take much. To... So yes, you could absolutely have them talking about Matt, right? It could go to the scene with the three of them, but it does put Varen there, right? For some reason, she's part of that scene, right? This is really about the Moraine, Varen, Swan moment uh, yeah. where, so mm -hmm. to me, this is how do we get her there versus it has to be. So if you, if you work out a scene where maybe Moraine is explaining what's happened and why it's important for them to go after the dagger, because what will happen, and Varen's there to kind of back her up and say, you know, maybe Varen's the expert in 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 uh, this evil, in, in essence, and what she knows about it, and what she's read about it, and she's pretty much just confirming everything Moraine's saying, and maybe adding to it, and having her there is important to set the stage of why this is a big deal. So there's a lot of exposition here, uh, and I I don't know, could we we get the dark prophecy right in this moment? Uh, is the dark prophecy even necessary? Do we need her? Well, so it gives us it gives us Lanfear. It gives us Luke and Isam. Yeah. Um. It gives us Toman Head. It gives us the it Watchers. Gives us Toman and... Head. Uh. So, I mean, the only note I really have after dark prophecy is I love Varen. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I might not be helpful. <laughs> well, um, yeah. So I don't know, but this scene, it's, it's almost too much exposition, right? I, yeah. Do we need, do we need Varen? Really, the thing that happens at the end of this chapter is she says, well, 20 years ago, I got my first clue, right? And, and yeah. the chapter kind of ends and you're like, you're like, did I need this piece no. about Varen? So, no. uh, Okay, Todd, you were going to also say something there. Me? No, oh, I was just agreeing. Yeah. Oh, you were just agreeing. Yeah. yeah. So this is a this is a possible kind of cut for me. I we have this whole dark prophecy thing. I think you can work that in in another place. You know, coming up from the dungeons. Um, you know, and because Perrin goes in to see Matt in the next scene, so I definitely think coming out of the dungeons. Um, you could just, you could have that, you know, Leanne's there. Maybe you have even them leaving the room with Matt and that's when Perrin goes in and sees him. So you get this, you know, you get this little scene with Perrin, but you could also cut this scene. I have cut it. I don't, I don't need a scene with Perrin and Leanne. Wow. Okay. How many, what does the rest of the panel think about this? I'm kind of on the fence here. You know, the Perrin, uh, Perrin and Matt scene. Is this a, is this a no go for you too, Todd? Yeah, I was. Uh, I have it as cut too. Okay. Uh, I got to keep it. It's th these are again the the characters that other large parts of the story will turn around. So this is like their kind of moment. We haven't really seen Perrin and Matt except as it relates to their friendship. So here's a chance to show the two of them together, and maybe also worried about getting accidentally bonded against their will because the Ice and I are eyeing them up and down. Yeah, you, you could merge these two scenes. In other words, you could still have, 
you could still have a scene about a healing having taken place and Perrin's there and you get like a little, you get maybe some wording of, in other words, you don't have to see Varen and have this large, long scene with Moraine, but she could, they could pass and Perrin could hear them say something about this dark prophecy as they're, you know, as they're speaking and he goes in and sneaks in to see Matt. There's a way you could kind of still keep some of this, but not have it be such an exposition on the one hand. And then this kind of, it's an important scene with Perrin, but it's really short, Tyler. It's just, uh, yep. He just goes in there and he kind of, you know, thinks about the fact that people were, that the lady Amelisa was looking for him. And you're like, okay, well, who cares? I guess that tells us what Perrin was doing, but it just kind of feels like, eh, that doesn't matter. You know, the, <laughs> the lady Amelisa. They can show us. Just, yeah, they could, we can see some of that happening. I don't think we need to know that. We obviously know that he cares about Matt. And maybe this, this, this comes up again in the next kind of scene with Rand. So now we have this Rand scene where he wakes and Perrin returns and they argue about kind of what Rand had said to them before wanting to leave. And they have kind of this bro moment, you know, where they where they both get kind of angsty together and they and they kind of leave and then land shows up. So I feel like all these can be kind of condensed. Um, <laughs> Perrin is an emo mode. Yeah. Mood. Yeah, exactly. Um, and that's. Uh, that's to me this a couple of these scenes just yeah I can drop off the uh, drop well, off the scene here. I mean you need Lan coming in and having this no, Rand moment for sure. To but. to just an argument for keeping the pair in peace with Rand is that we haven't seen Perrin mad. Yeah, no, that's like, true. Like we haven't seen him irritated. Um he's usually the calm, cool, thoughtful one, so to see him get annoyed with Rand um, and just like storm out, like that's, I, you know, it's a it's a fleshing out of character that we haven't seen before. But mostly, I just need a reason to keep Ran in that room because if we don't keep that moment with Lan, I I will revolt. <laughs> You're like, since they already have the room, the production yeah. crew is already doing this room scene. We can always have Perrin come in and have a moment with him. Yeah, sure. no, it, it does. It it builds this. But you're right. There is some tension that eventually happens when they leave Feldara. Uh, between the th Matt, Perrin, and Rand. And persisting that tension a little bit, uh, if we do have that go throughout the first or the second season or second book here um, and want to keep that tension between the three of them. I don't know. It serves a point to me, this kind of like he thinks he's Lord Rand. And, you know, I I get it. Uh, I don't feel that it was like this really important overarching theme of, of the great hunt it was the angst between these three. And then they come back together and they're like, it, it, they eventually break up and maybe you have to kind of seed the breaking out into their own roles uh, this way. But so, so I'm okay with leaving the parent scene here. I just, I feel like it's overly teenage. The Lord Rand piece with the clothes though, Matt is important down the line in chapter 11 when the boys find out about him channeling. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we have parents show up after he's gotten dressed. <laughs> maybe like Lan gets sure. him all dressed up and he lands trying to convince him and, and, and Rand's saying something and doing something is all dressed up. And then parent walks in and he's just like, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> yeah. I like it. I like it. Okay. Um, by the way, to those of you that were, if you were waiting, uh, the phone line died here. Uh, so I will see if I can't can get that back up and get a call before the show's we've just been going on here. Um, uh, but regardless, we'll let you know when, when and if the phone lines get back up. Uh, when we, we, we get this land scene, and you just brought this up, Tal. We have to have this land scene here. Why is it, why do you think this is a key scene when he kind of plays dress up with Rand? It's so beautiful. <laughs> it's just it's just a beautiful is it, <laughs> that's why you want to keep it <laughs> i just get really excited because now i can see them and i can just imagine daniel henny like trying to just be like listen you gotta try you might not win but you have to try and you can't go in looking like an idiot so <laughs> just do the things that i'm telling you to do and by the way here's a beautiful pen i love you <laughs> I, I like how joe perry pointed out uncle lan yeah there is a <laughs> there is a yeah there, i like this scene and i think it does help build this relationship you know lan says a lot of things uh between this scene and the next 
um, about how he, you know, I, and this is probably kind of developing over the first season of the Wheel of Time TV series and, and, the, and the book, obviously, of Eye of the World, which is, you know, Lan kind of comes across maybe a bit cold, but how much he actually does care for Rand. Um, and, and maybe that, you know, uh, maybe this is part of that, which is he really, really cares. Like he says, like, well, I trained you. And, you know, maybe seeing part of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. It's all about the fact that you trained him. So you want him to show him. But you you actually really care about this guy, don't you? So I, I do like for that scene. I mean, Tyler, are you for keeping this? Oh, yes. And the, the whole, I think, discussion with Lan leading him down to his meeting is pivotal. A lot of important stuff gets exchanged between them. Um, mm-hmm. but it really is about that relationship being like, this is how you behave. You're going to go through a lot of trouble. And every time you face it, this is how I want you to behave. Don't you dare fall down on the job. <laughs> and yeah. it also shows that Lan knows how to play the game because there's a lot of stuff where he's, he's doing things just, just to poke, you know? Um, <laughs> oh yeah. The way, the way he point. tells him to walk, the way he, when he, when he says, when you go in, you bow. And he says, well, I don't know how to bow to the Amarillo. And, and, and he says, but I remember when I did it with the queen and, and do it like Land's that. Like, yeah. That's the way to do it. Yeah, <laughs> do that. You know, so yeah. it, it's just, he's, he's poking at everybody, you know? And, I and, mean, and I like that. The other, the other piece that I will just flag that maybe isn't intuitively obvious to you guys um, is that it's a really beautiful example of of like non toxic masculinity? Like it's a beautiful <laughs> friendship and re- uh, don't laugh. It's a nice example. You of told a me I was going to laugh. <laughs> you said <laughs> you guys are going to probably laugh. <laughs> between men that isn't like it's not a bromance. It's just a really beautiful mentorship. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like it. No, I agree with that. And I was I was laughing <laughs> just because. Uh, you told me not to laugh, and then you said it, and my, my brain was like, "You should laugh," and then it made me laugh. <laughs> no, I agree with that. I this is a, I mean, it's a fun scene, and I hope that they do it really well here. Um, but I do love the whole, you know, as this turns into cat crosses the courtyard moment, um, his relaxed, arrogant saunter as he goes into the mm-hmm. the women's apartment. Uh, there is part of this where I do, yeah. I do kind of want to, see, I do want to see this kind of play out a bit uh, I, I, as it happens. Because uh, if if this makes sense, I do like it from the uh, perspective also that they've set up the Aes Sedai as the power team, right? The power group, and mm-hmm. and here's Lan doing his damnedest, right, to to make sure that Rand doesn't walk into this moment, which he knows is going to be pretty pretty hard. harsh, hard, yeah. And and not have anything. He's trying to give him just something, so he doesn't walk away mm-hmm. completely demoralized and and in essence almost psychologically leashed to the Aes Sedai. Right? He wants he wants him to kind of you know put his back up and not just be railroaded here. So I, yeah. I do like that piece of it a, a lot. So so Tal, talk to me about this next scene. Uh, Rand's interactions with the Amarillan. Like speak to so, speak to this. We don't we don't get that yet. Um, so chapter eight is titled the dragon reborn, uh, hint, hint, maybe not. (laughs) Um, so, uh, you know, we keep the, I I vote. So we walk up to the entrance of the ladies of the women's quarters and he has this really lovely little interaction with Liana. Um, that's really cute. So I hope they keep it, uh, where he's asking permission and she's raising her eyebrows at Lan. Um, (laughs) I think that this part of the story, as much as it's about everybody, needs to still come from his perspective because it's the most intimidating. Like, I think the viewer needs to be looking through his eyes um, or just have it mostly be from his POV personally. Um, and and then we leave them. And we get an interaction between Nynaeve and Lan because they're, we move to the courtyard. And uh, in the courtyard, uh, Nynaeve runs into, or Lan gives Nynaeve his ring, uh, calls her Mashiara, uh, not for the first time. I I'm can't not, recall. Yeah, I don't know about the first I time. I don't there, think yeah. it's for the first time. Um, uh, and, then, and then there's this really spicy scene between Moiraine and Nynaeve where she thinks Moiraine heard his rejection of their relationship and Maureen calls her out and basically says, you're going to have to come with me to the tower if you want to defeat me. 
Like, if you want to mm-hmm. take me on and beat me and take everything that I have, you're going to have to come and figure it out. Um, so I have, I have lose the scene between them, but I think it's really evocative. Uh, there's also a really lovely scene between Nynaeve and uh, Egwin. Hold on, hold on. Where hold they on. talk. So oh. there is that scene, but there is this whole piece of Rand going in, his part where he talks to, um, talks to the Amarillan and hears the story. I skipped story. it. Sorry. Yeah, so, yeah. No, it's okay. So there's this piece, right? Where No, no, no. I think you're right. I, and I don't want to uh, uh, completely go back from what you said. The scene about uh, with Nynaeve and Lan, I think, is an important one. It's another one of these pieces of goodbyes, right? Yeah. Uh, you... A lot of that's happening here, and I, and I think it's, it's useful. I don't need every single one of these goodbyes, but I think this one's really important between the two of them. Hopefully, they've done a good job. I didn't really, in the eye of the world, I didn't really catch this relationship that much, but it might have been because when I first read the books, I was 15, and, and they didn't matter as much to me. Uh, I, and I like, so I like that aspect of it um, uh, as far as uh, really, hopefully, kind of carrying along whatever they've done up to this point with Lan and Nynaeve. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, this is an important scene and understanding about what's about to happen with them. But I, I do want to revisit or Rand going into the Amarillo. And I, and I want to let everybody know the phone line is up. Uh, we'll be uh, we'll probably go another t- 20, 30 minutes with the show. So if you want to give us a call, feel free. If you haven't agreed or not agreed, the phone number is one three one three eight two five five nine six eight. That's one three one three eight two five five nine six eight. Feel free to call us and uh, you know tell us how much you either. <laughs> like the scenes we've cut or kept or what you think we should add, we'd love to hear from you. So, but yeah, the, uh, Rand walking in and talking with Almerlin, I think this is a really important scene also. Uh, yes, I skipped a page, I'm sorry. No, it's okay, no, it's okay. In my notes, I missed a whole page. This is where Rand learns a lot about his his story. And that's why yeah. it's so, so important here. This is exposition that I'm, 100 percent fine with <laughs> right here yeah no maureen's maureen's uh retelling of story of 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 the whole thing is this beautiful monologue yeah. um that reminds me more than anything else of her telling of Mane- of uh Manethrin. um yeah and so i think it's really important never mind that it's the basis for like entire new spring but flying um you know the amarillin seat looks him in the eye and says you are the dragon reborn like what <laughs> Yes. And yeah, she and says, we're not yeah. doing anything. Off you go. Like, go go do the things in the world that you were meant to do. And he's just like, WTF? Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, he's been he's been manipulated up to this point. And as he perceives <clears throat> that he it, right? he can't see that, yeah. yeah. He still but, thinks he's being manipulated. Right, and he's, I, I won't be controlled. I won't be on your leash. You know, this feeling comes across from him that Lan's kind of prepared him for. Um, and then we get the story of Tam Althor here. And... And I don't know. I mean, I don't know how I want to see with that. I mean, do we want it to be, you know, do we want just Moraine telling the story? Do we want a visual? Do we want to, you know, do you want really those want kind a of montage. like, do we want a montage? I don't know. Yeah. I kind of, I wonder about I mean, about I do. Mo- I'm not going to get one, but I want <laughs> I know. one. I know. You're animated. right. Part of an animated. No, no. <laughs> they better not do an animated montage. I'll kill Come them. on, it'd be so great. <laughs> no, uh, no, but I, I, yeah, part of me wants a montage here. I think it would be a little bit, you know, I, I'm not really for it, other than just from a fan geeky perspective. I just want, I just want to see Tam back then because part of me just hopes we someday get Tam's story. Uh, so yeah, I, this this piece about his, learning his history. There's no question, right? So. Todd, do you want this to feel like they're manipulating him or do you want the viewer to walk away here believing that this is the true story? I I want the somebody to, I want you to walk away believing it's the true story but kind of knowing underneath that they're they're going to do their best to manipulate everything that they can. Yeah, okay. It's kind so of wanna, a, yeah. It, it's kind of you know there's that undertone even though even though they deny it there, there's still that, you know, they're going to be with him. They're not going to just let him ride. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, uh, before I get your opinion on this, Tyler, let's uh, let's bring Nick in. We haven't talked to Nick in a couple of weeks, it feels like. Let me, uh, let me bring in Nick in. Hey, Nick, welcome back to the Dusty Wheel. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing pretty well. And Man, how I don't is feel, everybody? I don't feel like we've spoken for like a month. <laughs> yeah, it feels... yeah. It, it, it's it's been about a month. I was I got really busy over the holiday season. Unfortunately, 
And then um, YouTube notifications. I missed one of your shows because I didn't get the notification that it was coming. Damn YouTube. What are you doing? Uh, so, uh, yeah, so what do you I think? YouTube notifications. Right. What do you think about tonight so far? Um, uh, yeah. What are we, what are we keeping? What are we killing? What are your thoughts? Um, I think we got to keep the scene uh, between Lynn and Naeem and, uh, and um, we got to keep the parent and Matt stuff because it's character building. But um, I wanted to skip it. I don't know if we're gonna, you guys are going to get there, but I wanted to skip ahead to the uh, to the mirror worlds. I've been thinking about it all night since the uh, since I saw the, the that you were going to hopefully get there. Um, I think that they need to keep the entire mirror worlds uh, section. Yeah. But they need to change it so that it's done really rapidly, like flicker, 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 flicker. Um, like that type of effect. Interesting. So that instead of like, instead of spending like, you know, half an episode in one world and, um, or, uh, half an episode in multiple worlds, uh, we see five, six, seven, ten, however many worlds they want to do, but we see them boom, boom, boom. And like 10, 15 minutes. And then, so it gives the, it gives the viewers an idea that the fact that, you know, like as bad as things seem now. Um, there are worlds where things are already a lot worse. And yeah, it also a, yeah. teases, it foreshadows, it foreshadows the very, assuming we have to assume they're going to get there. It foreshadows the very end where Rand and the Dark One are, are uh, fighting by showing each other different possible worlds. Um, and it also foreshadows if we do, if the show does any of the, uh, of like the of Rand's dreams being haunted, where like he's being shown uh, worlds where he loses over and over again. So okay, so there's two things here, yeah, no, and and yeah, you're right. We're probably not going to get to the first instance of the mirror world tonight. Uh, there was just so much. There's such a dense story being told here in Faldara that mm -hmm. it was hard for us yeah. to get hard for us to very, rush through very. just some key pieces here. So yeah, we probably won't get to Faldara until next month when we cover it in part three. I mean, sorry, to the mirror world. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. Is there any way to kind of uh, flicker through uh, the events in that mirror world? The the one that happens, we'll, we won't be getting to the one that has the actual living multiple lives and going through multiple worlds. Uh, that happens l much later in the story. The one that happens that we'll be getting to would be the one where Rand and Loyal uh, and Hurin are in the mirror world and Lanfear is there with them. And and that one happens in a single mirror world, uh, and they but no, but, they but I'm are... saying that they should they they should combine the scene. I'm aware that they should combine the scene from later gotcha. in the story. You want them to do you want, okay. instead of like instead of showing us a single mirror world and then later showing us like a flicker, they should just combine those two things. Interesting, okay. and then show them all all to us at once. Yeah, um, you, because yeah, because you, like you know uh, all can. Alternate worlds are not a big part of the story, so you should combine it all, get it all out of the way at once. I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. So instead of making the portal stones and these uh, mirror worlds uh, a repeating theme throughout, you're thinking have this event be singular and maybe in the process of them going through a portal stone and having this event, Rand somehow disappears also or something to that effect. Like you could, you could probably merge. I, and I see what you're trying to do there. It's an interesting idea. I never thought about trying to merge those two events. Mm -hmm. I love mirror worlds. So you're not going to find a fan in me. <laughs> I want them to do more mirror worlds, not fewer <laughs> of them. Um, so in my head, I'm like trying my best to make that a, a possible reality. But uh, part of me is just like, no, damn it. We need more mirror worlds. Uh, well, yeah, since we cut land idea. fair, we can go and we can just jam through this real quick. <laughs> we're, not, we're not cutting land fair. Shut that's, up. That's true. Uh, by the way, uh, Tal, just so you know, everyone, I don't know if you're watching uh, chat, everyone loves the little kitten um, on your shoulder. <laughs> that's awesome. Her name is Ruby. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, before we let you go, Nick, I want to uh, I want to know about that dungeon scene. What's your favorite part about the dungeon scene? Mm, um, I I really like the idea of uh, Pat and Fane torturing the troll off until it learns how to write. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, I, 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 and in fact, I like that idea so much that I think they should show that because, in in, in all seriousness, they if, if they were to go that route, they should show that because it shows just how demented. Uh, Pat and Thane is, and it sells the idea later that even the um, Dark Lord's minions are afraid of him. Because later you get a scene with the Murdral, and like the Murdral is terrified of him. And mm -hmm. 
um, this would help sell that reality of him being uh, that terrifying. Shoot, yeah. Well, hey, thank you very much. I love that idea of him torturing uh, Trollock, and that's a great way to leave us. Hey, Nick, thank you much, very much for calling in. We always appreciate it, man, and we'll see you next week. Yep. Talk to you later. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. And uh, to our caller, uh, Dwayne, you were on. We, uh, it looks like you dropped off. Please give us a call back. Uh, happy to chat with you. Uh, we just missed you, and we had a little problem there with the, uh, the call-in software. So sorry about that. But, yeah, call back in. The call line is still open. Uh, but to that point that Nick just made, I do like that addition to that scene. Uh, giving Fane – it might introduce his ability to – or his strengths a little bit too quickly, but I – the idea that he might torture a Trolloc there, I just appeals to me. <laughs> yeah, because when they're when they're chasing them, they are kind of because they. Uh, I don't remember if it's Huron or Ingtar. One of them makes the comment that they're weaving all over the place, and it's kind of like a a fight for power between Fane and the Mirror Draw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, let's bring uh, let's bring Lancer and see what he has to say. He just jumped back on. Hey, Lancer, welcome back to the Dusty Wheel, man. How you doing? Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, welcome back. Merry New Year. Yeah, Happy New Year, man. Uh, so, uh, what do you uh, what do you have to say about what we've what we've uh, what we've live adapted tonight? What's in your mind? Well, keep the dreams. We want dreams. Dreams are good <laughs> because you can do so much. Um, you can do so much foreshadowing, like our last caller said. So much foreshadowing that you can do with the dreams, especially if you can do really cool effects. With, I can't remember what movie it was, but it's some sort of effect where the dreams did something and then once the, if the, once the dream was over, there was like a wisp of smoke or something like that or some other thing that you can do. You can do all kinds of things, and especially when Rand gets his second Aaron mark, you know, that's when you can go, oh, wait a minute, this stuff is real? Oh, snap. So, you know, you got to keep the dreams. Man, you don't have to convince so, me you know that. That's, and, that's and, awesome. and as Joe just said in chat, yes, dreams. No, I agree with that. If they're going to do some... If there has to be exposition, I'd love for it to just be in a dream, right? Um, in, in the end of the day, uh, the dream is going to be starting to play a much larger role when Egwene gets to the White Tower and with Lanfear involved and uh, these portal stones and obviously Teleron Riyad is going to come in significantly. Uh, but I do understand what everyone says, which is, yeah, too much, too quickly. We just don't need it right now. And so I'm, you know, I'm kind of on the fence there, which I have been, which is, you know, kind of just cut it down, minimize them to be not so significant and build that into the next, you know, into the part where it obviously is going to play a significant part. So, no, I appreciate that. What's your, uh, what's your favorite part of the dungeon scene before we let you go? Oh, uh, I do like that, that scene with, uh, with Moraine telling Rand, yeah, that you're a dragon reborn. I, that was a pretty fun scene to, uh, read when you were saying it, it, remi it reminded me of it and i was like oh yeah huh. <laughs> it's been a while since i've done a reread so <laughs> yeah yeah no that's a, so, that's yeah, a that's that, that that scene is, with the is, yeah with the amarillo and i think that's an important one that we just talked through yeah absolutely and i uh, i do hope that they uh they give us that one for sure so hey man i really appreciate it. it's awesome to hear from you happy new year and i am 100 percent sure we're gonna talk again here in a in a, in a week or two Hey, I appreciate you calling in. That's that is true. Hey, by the way, can I ask Kyle yeah. something real quick? Was that mimosas that you were drinking the last time you were on the show? Because you were like you sipping on some sort of. Well, I was just wondering because it looked like it was OJ, but I could have sworn it was it was in a wine glass. So were you it was in drinking a on mimosas? Glass, <laughs> oh, there you go. See? <laughs> See? Okay, I called it. Great question. <laughs> hey, thanks, man. Have a good one. We'll talk to you soon. Later, y'all. Bye bye. Bye. So yeah, uh, back to our, back to the, the adaptation. Egwene and Nynaeve have uh, an interaction also, and Tal, you kind of spoke to wanting to keep this interaction. Uh, also, do you think this one? Why do you think this one's necessary? No, sorry. I, I want to keep the one between Maureen and Nynaeve, but not the one between Nynaeve and Egwin. Because it's just Nynaeve saying, I don't think you should call me the wisdom anymore. I'm not the wisdom. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot um, of there's a lot of these type of scenes that I'm not really yeah. <laughs> it's not really required, if you will. No. Uh, anyone for keeping the scene with uh well even even to this part where do we need this whole Rand and Egwene? This kind of feels like Rand's writing his dear 
Egwene letter here, right? He's just like, you're going to become Aes Sedai and we can't be friends anymore, but I love you. You know, like there's a really kind of, there's this like really kind of emo moment uh, between them. And so I don't know. I, I, I get that we kind of want to say goodbye, but do we need this scene with Rand and Egwene? I'm going to say no, but, but there's also the, the the fact that these are two people who were kind of promised to each other by the rest of the village. Like, you are going to be a couple. We've already decided in the woman's circle that you're going to marry Egwene. And they're saying, we don't have to follow that rule. They have been shipped since they were children. And now <laughs> they're saying, actually, we're not, not going to be a couple. We're going to go our own separate ways. And you don't see that a lot in TV. They, you just see eventually the couple gets together. And this is kind of a uh, uh, throwing a curveball, I guess, compared to a lot of other shows where you everyone expects the two main characters to get together. And in the end, these two won't. And they will quite deliberately go off and do very different things. And it's, that part is kind of fun. Yeah. No, OK. OK, you brought me back. You brought me back a little bit here. Uh, I do like that. Maybe I just want it rewritten. Uh, I'm hoping for a little bit less. Uh, you know, sophomore high school kind of, you know, uh, 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 chatter and maybe just something. Have you seen but I, the cast? <laughs> I know, I know. That's what that's what I'm saying. That they, they do. They don't. They seem at least to be seniors, if not, you know, first year, <laughs> first year, first year of college. Uh, you know, I, I I'm hoping for for uh, a little bit more here. Uh, you know, where the break is pretty significant and you can you can feel it maybe i just maybe i haven't given that scene enough play in my mind it just feels like it's like okay whatever whatever leaving you know so uh before we jump into chapter nine here and and finish up uh let's bring in Dwayne. Dwayne called back first time caller i think hey Dwayne, welcome to the dusty wheel how are you doing tonight i'm good how are you guys Good. Oh, hey, good. Thanks. Good. thanks for calling in. So uh, what's in your mind? What have we talked about or what did you want to bring up about the Great Hunt? Um, actually, I was just seeing if I could actually get through and um, have a chat with you guys or whatever you guys want to talk about. Okay. So when it comes to the Great Hunt, uh, I've been asking everyone this. When it comes to the Great Hunt and the scene where Rand runs down into the dungeon um, and finds Egwene and Matt... Is there a portion of that dungeon scene that's just more, most impactful to you as a reader? Um, positive carnage left behind. Okay. And, um, you know, them, them slumped, slumped down and um, just the violence, the violence that, uh, that you could see. Yeah, there's this is a this comes back to kind of how Rafe is going to take this, right? Like this could be an extremely violent scene. Um, oh yeah, and and that really the question is how much Rafe goes down that road. Do you want this to be? Uh, and that's what, maybe this is a question for everybody in the call, but maybe first to Dwayne. When you say you know the violence kind of speaks to you, obviously it should. Do you want this to be the PG thirteen version of that dungeon scene, or do you want it to be like the rated R version when it comes to TV? Well, not not PG thirteen, but um, you know, adult. Okay. You know, yeah. not uh, not over the top, obviously, but uh, um, just something that says to to the audience that's watching, people that are watching, that uh, like, wow, this this gets really real. I mean, I decapitated know. heads on a table. <laughs> yeah, that's only you... if you can well, do them I'm well. Not, I'm not sure if I'd go that far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so this is a good question it's it's how far you go with that he has a lot of room that's for sure because what Rand describes is pretty disgusting Gross. yeah so rafe has a lot of room not that he wouldn't yeah. if he wasn't described there but he has a lot of room to determine that and that's really going to determine uh now this isn't the only scene where this happens right obviously we have a lot of these scenes building up until th this moment uh but yeah this is one where it's you know, uh, where it's pretty much uh, the kind main of, one of the uh, like a, a a wow a wow moment, like uh, yeah, stuff got real. 
Yeah, yeah. And maybe that's what Rafe real. uses this moment for, which is it's been really real up to this point, but this is when it gets real personal with Rand, right? Rand walks into this scene and what's been done to his friends and what's written on the wall is for him. And it's very personal, right? And this is, the, like I said, the goodbye that Fane leaves compared to all the goodbyes here in the first 10 chapters. This one is the most impactful to me and it, and it speaks to what's about to happen for the rest of the season, which is this chase uh, for the horn and, and Pat and Fane's relationship with Rand. So, sorry, what were you gonna say, Tom? A dude kills himself in front of him. Like, that's how bad it is. Yes, but right. Rand, Rand is totally emotionless about it, though. At the he time, he doesn't even yeah. care. Yeah, he no, doesn't, he doesn't even care. register. Yes, well, he's looking for his friends. So, yeah, Dwayne, and that's a that's a good thing uh, to bring up for sure. I didn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't catch the the whole show, but uh, would that be like a smash the black kind of moment? <laughs> it's, it could be. We are so close, but yes, yes, that is a. Uh, that's definitely a smash to black moment. Uh, well, see, that's a good question. Um, to me, well, maybe the smash to black moment there is when that's a when that's happening, right? Yeah. So when the carnage is taking place before Rand gets down to the dungeons, that's a great smash to black moment where the entire audience just can't wait to see the next episode. Uh, but oh, yeah. before, before he gets there. Yeah, before yeah. he gets there to me, because when he's there, right, like, that's like the beginning of a lot of things that are about to happen. It's not the end. So I, I you, yeah. Do you think they'll actually show show it happening, or just the aftermath? I, I don't, I don't know, and I don't know what I want. Again, it's this question of how adult do we want the show to be, because it can be varied, and how do we want it? How adult is it? Is it going to be from the very beginning? Is it going to build? Uh, you know, but seeing some, I, I do want to know. I want to have some hint about Rand, what Rand might find, but not know in detail what he will find. In other words, I, I want to know something bad is about to happen um, and how terrible it might be and then and smash to black there. I think that's a great cutoff moment there uh, when, when Fane escapes and and having that moment happen. So, But yeah, uh, having some inkling of what's about to happen, that's kind of where I am for that. So. Hey, Dwayne, thank you so much for calling in. really appreciate that. Uh, thanks for being a first-time caller. Hopefully you'll give us another shot uh, as the weeks go on and come back either for our live adaptation okay. episode or, or one of the other ones. But I appreciate you calling in and sharing your thoughts. Thanks for having me. Yeah, have a good night. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah, this is it. I don't want to thematically make this whole episode have been about that scene, but I think it's such a pivotal scene. So uh, I feel like it's fitting, Matt. Like... <laughs> Yeah, it is. I mean, what other the scene would it be about? I, well, the scene we're about to come up to, I can't believe we didn't get out of Feldara, but we probably yeah. should tie this show up here in the next couple of minutes. But we're about to enter the courtyard where everyone's leaving. And, you know, and Lan gives Nynaeve the ring. And we have this Nynaeve moment where she hates on Moraine. And she's like, I'm going to get you, you know, in essence. And, uh, and so... I guess that's right at the end there. And then we have this this leave taking going on. So uh, because we're running up to the kind of 815 moment, I know we didn't get that much further, but we are leaving Faldara. To those of you that are watching, <laughs> I promise the next time we come back to live adaptation, we're going to get out of Faldara. We'll get on the road. And I swear once we get on the road, things are going to move and cuts are going to happen because this book is so dense and so many things are taking place once the team starts splitting off into smaller groups here that we aren't gonna be able to keep it all. But to me, these Faldara scenes are really fundamental to setting up the entire following sequence and getting out to Tome mm -hmm. and Head and Leandrin and the betrayal there and Varen and all these things are coming together. So really hoping that they keep most of this, uh, really hoping we get up to Faldara and we have this moment because this, to me, this is what makes, this is one of the reasons why The Great Hunt is I think Last time I ra rated this, The Great Hunt is, uh, I think, either the first or second in my favorite books of the series. And this yeah. is what happens. This is why. It just is an amazing kickoff to a book, and you just can't stop reading. So really appreciate all of you showing up in chat. 
Uh, hopefully I was able to bring in some of the stuff that you were talking about. You always make me laugh if you watch the video. Often when someone of the panelists is saying something really important or you know really sad and I'm smiling, it's not because I'm a sociopath. It's because I'm reading your comments <laughs> and they're really funny and then I feel really terrible because I'm like, oh, I don't think that was a laugh moment that, that, that was meant. There's a delay. <laughs> There's a, Yeah, exactly. Hey, uh, Tyler, thank you so much again for joining us and... And next week, we'll be back doing a Wheel of Time content creators episode. And I'm really excited because I finally figured out in my mind how the live theory episode is going to work on the 29th. So oh, if good. you want to try that out, it's going to be a lot of fun. And part of that is going to be you bringing your own Pat and Fane related theories to the show. And yes. we're gonna, everyone's going to get a chance, hopefully, even those of you in the chat, to, to bring up your Pat and Fane theory and we'll do some quick breakdown and how much we love it or hate it and we'll break it down. We'll have a lot of fun with your theories. But that will be one of those episodes where I actually go first, I think. Uh, <laughs> I, I, will take, I will take the liberty of going first and, and take covering the pressure my, off us. That's right. I'll, I'll throw my theory out and, and hopefully, though, you'll all share your own. We'll have a lot of fun doing that. So anyway, we'll see you next Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern. If you haven't liked the channel, please do. That'd be awesome. And to my panelists, as always, love you. Thanks for being with us. And as we say, good night from the dusty wheel and smash to black. <laughs>